Eh, también ha colaborado con investigaciones de diversos países, que algunos están presentes aquí, como el doctor Casillas, el doctor Fernando Castillo y el doctor Jim Holland. So, doctor, as you can see, you are between friends. Uh, sin más preámbulos, pues démosle la bienvenida al doctor Major Goodman. Gracias. After that modern talk, I'll take you back one century, roughly, <laughs> in terms of corn breeding. And the question is, can I operate this? Now, quite frankly, breeding with exotic germplasm is, is generally not a highly regarded field. Uh, if you um, look at the current status of the major companies in the United States, they're essentially one breeder, one company, one germplasm in total with Pioneer and another that works with Monsanto. And that's just about it. Now, one of the problems is it's a, it's a difficult thing. Because there are deleterious recessive mutants that are not only exotic, but they are Basically, breeding with exotic germplasm is much like breeding a totally new crop. There's no real demand for the product. Almost everyone feels that nothing good is going to come from the effort. There's certainly little or no institutional support. Uh, I'll take a silly example. My first year in the crop science department, I had $8,000 of departmental money to work with. The second year, I had $2,000. And since then, I've only had bills. <laughs> now, Arnold Hollauer's observation that most genetic ver diversity is detrimental is certainly correct, and it is probably understated. But the corollary is, the less elite the diversity is, the more detrimental it's likely to be. Our success with exotic germplasm has largely been possible due to data for and access to and intercrossing of elite tropical inbreds. Now the data for 
was provided by Summit, which in 1971, 72, 73, published worldwide trials of commercial and public hybrids. And I picked off what I thought were the best of these and sent off my postcards to the companies and to the institutions involved. And I got some seed back. It wasn't always the seed I asked for, but it was seed. And I proceeded to intercross those hybrids in a dial-out. Now, this had absolutely nothing to do with plant breeding at the time. I was in the Department of Statistics, where I was on a National Institute of Health funded project. And I was interested in whether or not perhaps the corn from Mexico and the corn from Bolivia might have different genes for photoperiod. And if you intercross them and raise the F2, the F3, the F4, some day-neutral material might segregate. Well, I made crosses between germplasm accessions. And with my apologies to Juan Manuel, um, these grew in the field something like this and mechanical equipment and that kind of plant structure just simply was not going to work. So I said, you know, could I answer the same question with a bunch of hybrids? And so that's why that got started. And it was purely accidental. But, you know, I got to thinking, Sprague started with the best standing inbreds back in the 1930s, and he made the uh, stiff stock synthetic pretty popular. And, uh, well, maybe it would be wise to try to do something with better material. Now, that's probably not possible today, but as late as certainly the early 90s, you could send a postcard off and get seed back. Uh, today, well, you'd better go to Summit. You'd better not go to NC State. We have trouble getting it shipped out. We have no objection whatsoever to sharing it, but uh, getting the phytosanitary certificates and uh, dotting all the I's and crossing the T's, uh, we have trouble. Uh, and if you're in commercial breeding, we want to charge you a royalty, or someone at the university wants to charge you a royalty. And basically everyone now has MTAs. Now, Simmet's MTA is probably the best of the lot, but NC State's lines are at least conceptually available to public programs, including Simmet. But uh, the private programs have to pay some money. And uh, our administrators are sort of surprised that the major commercial companies are really not interested in NC State lines. And one of the reasons they're not very interested in NC State lines was in the last talk. Pioneer, for example, and I'm sure Monsanto and Syngenta and several others, uh, have excellent records, pedigree records, phenotype records, for a whole series of lines. And some line coming out of NC State is probably not going to interest them very much. And uh, if we're going to have to pay royalties with uh, MTAs that are almost undecipherable, they're not very interested. Now, our initial experience with actual introgression came about in the early 80s when uh, I moved from statistics to crop science and took over the corn breeding program. 
Uh, fortunately, my predecessor was very good, but he had a very bad reputation. And I was actually looked upon as a breath of fresh air. Now, I think, <laughs> I think that has probably passed, but uh, he had developed NC250, which had excellent resistance to southern corn leaf blight, had excellent resistance to gray leaf spot, and it had excellent resistance to yield. Uh, as a result, we developed uh, a good many lines that uh, were very disease resistant and uh, unfortunately very yield resistant. Our second experience with introgression involved various back crosses to NC state lines uh, from crosses to Pioneer 3737. Now, I don't know quite how we acquired Pioneer 3737, but when I told Pioneer I was doing this, I did not get a cease and desist order, so I guess it was legal. Uh, 3737 was a uh, completely non-stiff stock hybrid, which was apparently known for stress resistance. And our goal was uh, earlier lines, since most of the lines that I've been developing are these all tropical or mostly tropical lines uh, that tend to be awfully late. And, uh, but unfortunately, our result was a fair number of fairly decent lines that were later than the NC State lines <laughs> and virtually none that were earlier. Now, today, the most extensive introgression projects are with transgenes, and I know nothing about transgenes, but it appears that some of the transgenes that involve fairly simple uh, enzyme blockage usually have very little effect on yield or standability or moisture, most, most anything else. But transgenes that code for proteins, such as BT, are often deleterious to some inbreds and hybrids. And all the back crossing in the world apparently does not cure this. Since these introgression efforts are done privately, um, and Pioneer, Monsanto, Syngenta, et al. don't want to talk about this publicly, uh, all of this is hearsay. But I can assure you that it's truthful. My first encounter was when one of my former graduate students who was working with a company that no longer exists told me that the very best BT for corn borer was developed by a company in Belgium, and it developed a great deal of BT, and it literally killed a fair number of inbreds. Now, as a result of this, there is, I think, at each major company, a group of people who are concerned with which transgene goes in which line, and how do you figure that out with the heterotic groups, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sounds like real exciting work to me, but there are people who are doing it. And uh, then there's this minor problem that you have to have herbicide resistance transgenes in the females. Uh, if you put the herbicide transgene in the male and you, your detasseling is not perfect or you get a little wind that's a little stronger than usual and the farmer sprays Roundup over his field and he notices that, you know, in a week's time, 5% of his crop is dead, that is not good public relations. Now the other problem is, in my opinion, and nobody seems to be talking about it, 
is that these traits are used on a worldwide basis and essentially the same traits, often the same promoter, same selective factor, frequently in the same genetic backgrounds. It appears to me that we're sitting on a situation very much like we were sitting on in 1969, just before the southern corn leaf bite epidemic. Now things obviously have changed greatly in the last few years. Uh, until the 1990s, Pioneer pretty much effectively controlled most of the important corn germplasm. Monsanto controlled the transgene development. And while germplasm is probably more important than traits, it's hard to write an advertisement that gets this point across. The other thing is, until the 1980s and even until early 90s, there was relatively free germplasm exchange. Now, some of that exchange was perhaps not quite legal, but it was, certainly was happening. Uh, today, it's just about impossible for, say, public programs to get a hold of private materials. And there are very few sources of elite materials that are available that don't have strings attached and cause problems with freedom to operate. Now, much of the program that I inherited in 1983 was largely tropical. And I was not trained as a plant breeder. I'm not quite sure what I was trained as, but it certainly was not plant breeding. I didn't bother to take any plant breeding courses in graduate school. Uh, but I got called in at 4.45 on a Friday afternoon to the head of the Department of Crop Science who politely said, the dean thinks it would be a good idea, the director of research thinks it would be a good idea. Do you have any objection to leaving the Department of Statistics, where I had excellent support, and taking over the corn breeding program in the Department of Crop Science? And after I gathered my teeth up off the floor, I, uh, said, do you mind if I think about this over the weekend? I didn't add. I had absolutely never thought about this at all. But at any rate, the program I inherited was really quite good. Um, and it consisted of mostly, well, largely, I won't say mostly, Simmet populations. Now, this was pre inbreeding at Simmet. Simmet was not in the, in the process of developing inbred lines in 1983. And these things dated back to the early 70s when the corn leaf blight came through. So, an awful lot was Simmet populations and pools crossed to elite U.S. lines. And then these, there were these inbreds that uh, I carried along with me that were derived from this elite tropical dialect. Now both are examples of intergradation, not introgression. Uh, I sort of think of introgression as being you stick your toe into the germplasm pool and hope you can sort of pull something out. Uh, Intergradation is a term uh, generated by Simmons where you just sort of jump in <laughs> and see what happens. Now, the crosses with the Simmet populations basically just didn't work out. I don't know why they didn't work out, but I suspect they didn't work out because the Simmet side of the germplasm uh, had never been inbred. And so it had never been flushed 
with the many deleterious alleles that kick around in corn. Now the first widely used temperate adapted all tropical lines came from the PhD work of Randy Holly, who now works at Pioneer. I sort of thought that he was working full time, but I gather he's more working half time on germplasm work. And a couple lines developed by Jose Moreno on his PhD thesis. Jose is from Ica in Colombia. They were all from these tropical dialel lines and their descendants. They've all had considerable use in the US and abroad. NC-296 was in a hybrid that was sold and wholesale in the United States. But keep in mind, the companies who sold it and wholesaled it, at least that I know about, are no longer in existence. And I don't know whether there was a cause and effect, but there could have been. Here's some results from 296 crossed onto a bunch of pioneer testers, and this was all done legally. Uh, roughly, they yield about the same. And we've shown over a period of time that you can develop competitive U.S. adapted inbred lines from basically all tropical materials, but it takes about 15 years. And you know, if you take a position with a university, you have about five to six years to make tenure. So I don't think many assistant professors should tackle this kind of job. And I suspect the same, essentially the same thing is true in private companies. You, you know, you're sort of expected to do something by five or six years. And I don't think any of the genomic magic that is useful for any number of purposes, as you just heard, is apt to shorten that time frame. The dihaploids from tropical by temperate crosses are largely a waste of time. They're very useful for many other things, but uh, wide crosses are not their strong suit. Now, when you look at public programs and you look at private programs, I think the only serious advantages that the private programs have are they have twin, pop, twin plot combines, which are extremely useful, and they have innumerable strip trials to try out new hybrids. Now, a number of these modern techniques, wow stockholders, but if you look, there's been relative little productivity as of yet from anything since transformation began. If you look from essentially 1996 to 2016, we've had maybe a six to 10% yield increase strictly from trait transformation. But keep in mind, that's a 20 year period. And ordinarily, an ordinary go out and kick a stock at the end of the season and see if it stands up type corn breeding has done about one and a half percent per year. So we have not had the great contribution to productivity that we would like to see and which we badly are going to need. Now we did participate in one strip trial of our own 
we went up to the western part of North Carolina and tested for gray leaf spot for many years. And one year, Pioneer had an open house for all sorts of people, including the two brothers who owned the land that the, the material was grown on. And they identified this particular hybrid as being useful and asked for enough seed to plant a strip trial. We were a bit reluctant to do this. We don't produce strip trial quantities of seed. You know, a, a big bag of seed is, is about three to five pounds for us. And uh, for a strip trial, it takes considerably more. Well, I'd be, hi I, I'd be very happy to hire those two brothers to help me select materials most any time. They, they obviously have a much better eye for hybrids than I do. Now here's the actual data. I don't know if it's re readable, but uh, the 296 hybrid topped the trial. Now, there's more to the story than that. There's a great deal that goes into how you present your data. You know, you have data, you can present it any number of ways. And this is the way Pioneer presented it. It's all there, except for one thing. On the back side of the page, which I looked at the actual so-called publication that this was in, didn't even notice it. Uh, the two brothers pointed it out to me, and I looked again, and oh yes, there it is on the back side of the page. So, you know, it's all there. It depends on how you present things. That's an important point to learn. We're now in a fourth uh, large integration study, which involves uh, providing uh, pollen blockage of uh, GMO pollen, or actually just foreign pollen of any sort, uh, mostly to organic maize producers, although the sweet corn folks have some interest in this and the popcorn folks have some interest in it. But there's a system that's long been used by popcorn breeders, I think for 50 years or more, to protect against damp corn pollen. And a, num and a number of organic breeders. Now keep in mind, this is a very small number of people uh, have adopted this system. And by accident, NC State has provided many of the lines used. They all came out of that dial L and descendants. Uh, but there are problems that exist and uh, that's led us into the current project. There are a couple problems with the GA1S system. It's, it's effectively recessive, so it's sort of time consuming to get it into lines that you want to use. Uh, Marcus Suber converted a number of white lines to this GA1 system back in the 1970s. Well, by the time the lines were converted, no one was interested in the lines. They, they, too old, too low yielding, didn't stand up well, etc. Then there's a promiscuous allele of GA1 called GA1M. Uh, this really has been most studied in, in Mexico by Jesus Sanchez and uh, Jose Ron at the University of Guadalajara. And GA1M is, is present at high frequencies. We're talking 50 to 70% frequencies. In much of Mexican open pollinated material, in Mexican hybrids by Pioneer and by Monsanto and by Monsanto. And from here to there to there to there, there is no chance to develop a continuing program when that sort of thing happens. Now, it's nice to have novel germplasm, good novel germplasm. And excellent testing is just essential. We've heard that already. 
if there's one thing that will improve a corn breeding program, it's more yield trial plots. Lots more yield trial plots. Lots more phenotypic data. The other thing that's essential is a good project technician. I wouldn't be here talking to you. without a good project technician and a good batch of graduate students. Now, Terry is sort of the exception. <laughs> no, no, literally. Almost every graduate student I've had has been excellent. And that doesn't happen with some people. Uh, some, and, and if you don't have that combination, it is very difficult to establish a successful corn breeding program. Now, of course, exotic germplasm is what I preach. I've been preaching it since 1970. You can see how far it's gotten me. But uh, you certainly need a breeder that's in place, in one place, for a long period of time. You need a good technician, and you need a long-term, continuously funded program with access to quality testing facilities. We probably have missed out on this, mostly because of quality testing facilities. I think Jim would agree with me that our yield trial programs are certainly not the best in the country. Now, exotics are sources of disease and insect resistance, often excellent resources. But the resistance is source-specific, and it's certainly not problem-free. Now, the GEM program, is called the Germplasm Enhancement of Maize program, is a 20-year-old program mostly financed by the USDA. It has been run from Iowa State and to a lesser extent from NC State. And it really is probably the best current example of a large scale use as much tropical germplasm as you can type program. But keep in mind that it has not had nearly the welcome that molecular approaches have. And if you want a crude count, you can just count the Iowa State. The land grant system is built on overhead monies generated. And it doesn't matter whether your program is wonderful or miserable, productive or non-productive, if you bring in overhead, you're in good shape. If you don't, you're cheese. <laughs> now, if the USDA decided to support one or two such public maize breeding programs on a continuing basis, would one even be welcome at most US land grant universities? Remember the overhead problem, or the lack thereof. Quite frankly, at the moment, the USDA ARS looks like the best bet for public breeding in corn and in many other crops. I've lobbied to endow field technician positions for a few critical corn breeding programs. This would cost about 50000 a year. You need a good technician, and you need a long-term, continuously funded program with access to quality testing facilities. We probably have missed out on this, mostly because of quality testing facilities. I think Jim would agree with me that 
our yield trial programs are certainly not the best in the country. Now, exotics are sources of disease and insect resistance, often excellent resources. But the resistance is source-specific, and it's certainly not problem-free. Now, the GEM program is called the Germplasm Enhancement of Maize program is a 20-year-old program mostly financed by the USDA. It has been run from Iowa State and to a lesser extent from NC State. And it really is probably the best current example of a large-scale use as much tropical germplasm as you can type program. But keep in mind that it has not had nearly the welcome that molecular approaches have. And if you want a crude count, you can just count the Iowa State. The land grant system is built on overhead monies generated. And it doesn't matter whether your program is wonderful or miserable productive or non-productive. If you bring in overhead, you're in good shape. If you don't, you're cheese. <laughs> now, if the USDA decided to support one or two such public maize breeding programs on a continuing basis, would one even be welcome at most U.S. land-grant universities. Remember the overhead problem, or the lack thereof. Quite frankly, at the moment, the USDA ARS looks like the best bet for public breeding in corn and in many other crops. I've lobbied to endow field technician positions for a few critical corn breeding programs. This would cost about 50,000 a year. This would cost about 50,000 a year. 